Hello and welcome to uh, a wild and woolly edition of The Ultimate Entrepreneur. Today is going to be what we call dueling banjos. Uh, I have as a guest a very prominent dental icon, Dr. Keanu Shaw. He practices in Palm Springs. Palm Springs area, Palm Desert. In Palm Desert. He is something of a hero to the dental community because he advocates what I call entrepreneurial dentistry, taking charge of your practice, making it your practice, not a practice you do for someone else. And he has uh, a very stellar history of starting growing his own practice to a very significant level, but he has 50,000 colleagues in the dental community that follow him and his uh, advice and his and his podcast. So this is going to be me interviewing him, sort of. We'll go back and forth and he'll interview me because it'll be shared in a dual uh, environment. I'm going to use it on ours, but he's going to share it with his professional uh, colleagues. So it'll be pretty fun. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Jack. Oh, it's great. It's going to be fun, fun, fun. So. I'm going to start, and then at intervals, we'll turn the tables, okay? Sounds great. Okay, so you have a very unique background in what you have done, not just as a dentist, but some of the feats you have, you have hosted, sponsored, created, and also what you stand for. And I think if you give us a little background to the people that don't know you in, in your industry and outside, it'll be very, very valuable so give me the backstory so i was a multi-practice owner and right. uh endured a lot of uh stress doing that actually before i got heavily involved in education and uh and actually lecturing and presenting and traveling at some point when, when I, my wife and i moved from illinois after the multi-practice we had there um, into uh, the california area i was traveling traveled to more than 300 offices and practice with the doctors doing the tougher tasks. So I kind of got a got a bit of an idea of the challenges challenges that my colleagues face uh, by. So were you functioning as a consulting dentist? The consulting was sort of on the side, but I was doing mostly surgeries, doing okay. the root oh, so canals and, and okay. implants cool. and things of that sort. Right. The tougher tasks that they wanted to keep the revenue in house versus referring it out. I got it. And, uh, and it worked out really good. They did the scheduling, but that left a lot of time to do one-on-one -on -one discussions with the doctor to sure. see what's uh, bothering them in the dental office. What did you discover? There's a pattern. I'm sure there are patterns that you're going to explain to us in marketing that you have learned and being in over a thousand industries. But the pattern that, that I observed was usually the issues that they encounter with insurance companies devaluing their products, their, wor their, their services. They're working harder, have less time with their families. Then uh, uh, HR issues in the office then some practices having issues with not being able to attract enough patients to keep the overhead going and having a little bit of extra something to put away for retirement. Uh, then excessive regulation, you got big pharma, uh, you have a lot of challenges that, uh, that uh, have gotten worse over the years that put us sort of in the corner and we're the good guys trying to give care to patients. And, and just an a inter, intermittent comment, the patient sitting in the chair wouldn't have a clue that all those pressures are constantly pervading upon the dentist. No, we have something very holy called the patient-doctor relationship. When I started, or when we signed up into medicine and healthcare, the idea was to help others without the interference of all the parties. I mean, with all of the issues, government-related, non-related, private uh, sector, at the end of the day, no one is supposed to interfere with the patient-doctor relationship. But they all want to because it's such a lucrative uh, industry. Yes. And they all want to come in and to, to a certain degree, they have succeeded. <clears throat> but again, without us, uh, 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 they would not be able to, to, to survive. And guests need to sort of behave when they come to a party, or usually they're asked to, to leave. <laughs> it's a good visual, yes. So our goal is to, well, in being in a lot of chat rooms and interacting with all of these doctors and hearing this over and over, people say, let's do something, let's do something. But nobody takes the first step or it's sort of the, the, the noise dies out yeah. after a while. In our belief, a peer-to-peer -peer system would be a possible solution to many of these problems that we face as an, as an industry. When we came here and I was doing all of that traveling, I also taking an MBA in international, uh, in international business at nighttime. Wow. 
uh, and practicing during the day and, tr and, uh, and also exploring different industries. I don't know if you recall or not, but uh, the, the blockchain, the peer-to-peer -peer industry exploded sure. for the financial sector. Sure. Where they were about able to create a lean system where uh, the borrower and, their, and the lender could work with one another without all the third parties and the extra exactly. fees and the banks and all yeah, of that. Yeah, very direct. Very direct. So th that sparked one idea, and then we did the Global Implantology Summit in 2018, where we were able to bring in uh, uh, 50 doctors from over 40 countries. Wow. Out of that came another meeting, which was the Executive Summit, where we brought in doctors in positions of authority in, different, in the supply chain to get their opinion. And more and more ideas flourished into the first peer-to-peer -peer platform that we call the world's top 100 doctors in dentistry. And, and uh, what is significant about that? It's certainly not about super superiority. We are all, in terms of dentists, we are all equals. We are working for the same thing. But uh, it was a very loud noise to be made. And it's been published in over 30 countries since January 1. That's wonderful. And we have gotten tremendous support from the vast majority of the industry. And uh, the people that get it, that understand what we're trying to do, uh, um, have been very supportive. It has created access for us into places we would never be able to go. And you know, access is, in my opinion, is, is, is market power and peer-to-peer -peer is access. And having that access is sometimes uh, more valuable than just the monetary sum. I agree, I agree. So you are probably one of the, the best observers of your profession and you probably more objectively can, uh, can empathize and also verbalize what they want more of, what they need, what they don't know they need. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what dentists are lacking, what they are trying to get closer to, away from, and what they don't even recognize that is a felt need that would perhaps, uh, if not transform their lives, practices, incomes would certainly go a long way to liberating them. So it starts off right after dental, well in dental school. We don't get any dental business training. They none. could bring us none. One course we had, if I look back at it, has nothing to do with real life at all. Now, it's not how it works. Why do you think, since you are thrust out into the world with enormous debt, and you're going to mention that, you have to put yourself in one of the most competitive environments going. It's covetous because obviously a successful dentist doesn't want to lose his patient load and they don't teach anything about marketing, strategy, uh, practice building. Nothing. And that's half the equation. No matter how good your dexterity and your knowledge is and how good you are in making crowns and root canals and uh, implants, if you don't have the business acumen that is required, you cannot succeed. And that's half the equation. That's where it starts really bad. That's why all these third parties find an arbitrage opportunity in us and in, in, in bringing us, giving us all these promises uh, that often do not materialize and robbing these people literally of, 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 of a future and a destiny because they're running in this hamster wheel. They can never pay their student loans, start their lives, get married, buy cars, pay their student loans off, invest, and all the things that need to happen to have the life that they once uh, uh, envisioned for themselves when they took on that half a million dollar debt and went to down school, right? Wow. So here we are, we lack this business acumen, they're afraid to go out and set up their own practices, which is literally the only way. If you, if you have equity and you have autonomy over your operation, that's how you have freedom in dentistry. And they changed that very aggressively for the pharmacists and optometrists, where they're now essentially around about the way technicians to, to these bigger corporations. They haven't achieved that yet in dentistry, but they're trying really hard. Wow. So what are you trying yourself to do to make a difference for all the dentists? So we can't save every dentist in the world. We can only try to do as much as we can for as many people as we can. So in order to, to we have maneuver, we're maneuverable, we have maneuverability, okay. which means we can help in the local community to differentiate ourselves. We can cut our supplies cost. We can learn from experts that have three, four decades of experience that know what works and what doesn't work and use that for us. The more the independent sole proprietor, which we by far outnumber the corporations, although they're hedge fund backed and they got a lot of capital, uh, there's things that we can use from experts that uh, we can apply into our own practices and stay competitive and at times, uh, you know, level the field a little bit. The dentists that work for 
corporations are probably denying themselves a future because they have no control, they have no equity, they have no real asset. You want to expound on that a little bit? Yes, so the common approach is to pay you a percentage of your income, and that's usually of collected, uh, not produced, but collected uh, numbers, and you get some benefits, and if you bark loud enough, they might give you some equity. Okay. But at the same time, they set the schedules, they hire the staff, they choose the most materials, they choose the laboratories, they choose the equipment, everything that, 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 that uh, has to do with quality care, which you should be doing because you learned what, it, what is right, you know what, uh, you, you know what uh, the differentiation should be and what a better material is than another, not just based on the numbers, but also there's, a, there's an interest in the patient. Uh, so, so everything that happens chair side and everything that happens outside of the chair has an effect on, on, on how you're going to render your care. So if the patients knew that some manager is sitting at some corporate office that's calling the shots uh, 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 and how they're going to do your treatment and how they're going to get into your pocket, they wouldn't be going to that office. But the problem is the patients don't know. 47 of the states in the U.S. require a dentist to be an owner of the practice. Oh, really? Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a corporate, uh, the, the doctrine of corporate medicine and okay. dentistry act. Uh, if you look into it, there's actually a survey done. So what these companies do, they set up entities in Florida and in Nevada and in Delaware. This management entity holds all of the assets. Some doctors put his or her name on 20, 30 offices, and then they bring in these young doctors and some floor managers telling them what to do. And that's not, that's not how it's supposed to be. No. It's supposed to be the guy that's on the site making the judgments and making the calls and, uh, and also uh, being, help, being able to be held responsible for their actions. So when things go sour, the company can turn around to that young dentist and say it's his or her fault and there's revolving doors. You as a patient don't always get to see the same doctor. Really? You don't have the same relationship. No, there's a revolving door for doctors in a lot of these operations. And uh, it just, everything you work for and the trust that we used to have, 20, 30 years ago the dentist was a community friend, was the top of the list of people you would turn to. Now it's these, these, these third parties, these insurance companies, these management companies, they're all turning our, our industry into a function for, for profit that uh, makes patients question us. Is this guy uh, honest with me? Is he trying to, trying to ch overcharge me, do all this unnecessary work? So it has a lot of effects on the dentistry that most of us don't like. Uh, 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 and uh, if we empower the sole proprietors, so they have more acumen in business, more acumen in marketing, more acumen in where they should get their continuing education, the people that they should be involved with. I think our, our, our industry has a future. If I'm currently stuck, so to speak, working for someone else or a corporation in a dead-end situation where there's no short-term chance I'm going to get equity in that practice, what do you recommend I do? Your best step is, I mean, when you come out of school, my recommendation is always is get in with a doctor that has advanced knowledge, associate with a doctor, with a sole proprietor for a year, for six months. I did for six months myself okay. before I bought my own practice, but you got to get your feet wet. You don't need a half a million dollars to set up your new practice. It's still worth it if you're coming out with a half a million to take out a hundred thousand dollars. Coming out with a half a million of debt. Yeah. As a student, it's still worth it to take the $100,000 and set up your own thing, okay. but it comes down to what knowledge do you have? Do you know how to pick up your location? How to, to, how to negotiate with your vendors and, and your landlord? Or are you gonna uh, uh, want the building and, and invest in that building? Is your location good? Is your marketing plan good? You have to have all those ducks in a row, but you can pull it off and uh, easily do a million dollars after your year two. And you told me your story, and, and yeah. at a million you're making a nice living, but you're building a, a, hopefully, if your ability and your proficiency is good, you're building an ever multiplying patient base, right? And also exploring the things I want to explore in life. I want to get into business. I want to get into helping other people. I want to do mission trips. I want to lecture. I do all of those things that you see. I'm sort of everywhere now yes. with my activities is because I only practice three days a week. And I do those numbers out of two chairs. I no longer have six offices and 90 employees and 12 doctors on staff. 80% uh, of them, 80% of the issues being HR related. When do I get my vacation? When do yes. I get my next raise? I have a peace of mind. I give quality care to my patients. They appreciate it. They compensate me well. And everybody's happy. Everybody wins. Uh, and 
And uh, the new thing now, the trend in dentistry is if I own five offices, I'm going to be somewhere skiing in the Alps. That's not how it works. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. You have to have that relationship. Patients uh, uh, reward you. You have a lot more, again, maneuverability in your local community. You cannot compete these corporations easily if you do it right. And I've seen it. Uh, 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 I've seen many people accomplish that. And I've been, you know, I've helped build over 30 practices from scratch in my time. That's fabulous. Yeah. Now, in, in that achievement, what are some of the universal uh, either denominators or success factors that you've seen have to be in place for the dentist to have a successful future? For our young colleagues, first of all, every successful or wealthy person that I know uh, came out of, out of humble beginnings. Okay. You, can't get, you can't go to your first job uh, to McDonald's on your first day and say, hey, I want a Lamborghini. It's yeah. not going to happen, right? You got to work yourself to the trenches. I mean, you've been in the trenches of capitalism for over four decades now. That's true. So you know how it works. <laughs> yes. So you don't need a half a million dollars. You got to take the first step and, uh, and uh, work with your colleagues. And not all colleagues want to want to charge you. I mean, I get students call me every every day, almost every other day. Doc, what could I do better? What could I do here? I'm stuck with this corporation. I broke my hand with this corporation. I was out for two months. They didn't pay me a dime. Is that true? Uh, yeah. I mean, stuff like that. I get these calls all the time. Oh, that's right? horrible. So, so you got to jump out and you got to start your own practice uh, uh, or associate with someone, but don't pick up all of the bad habits or good habits. Look at the habits of all the other doctors that are successful and choose for yourself the way you want to run your own office. Ultimately, you got to make the decision. It's your license. It's your, it's your livelihood. But uh, uh, if you're working for somebody else, you're going to make their dreams come true, not your dreams. You want to make your dreams come true. That's a good, that's a good delineator. So if I want to be able whether it's best practices or whether it's the best practices of somebody that I believe in because there's lots of different styles, lots of different uh, business strategies. How do I do that best? I mean, it, it, I mean, most people I don't really think take the time to not just model, but you can't model till you first identify that the person or the business you're trying to model represents attributes that parallel your belief system, your aspiration level. So do you have any advice for that? Well, it's, it's different in every market. You have to know your environment. What they taught us in, in, in business school was uh, market sampling. You know, you can put a little bit of money towards uh, this paper, a little bit to TV, a little bit to radio and see what works. And then in the second round, you come in and invest more in those. We have these problems where we get burned a lot. A lot of my colleagues get burned by so many different groups and people yes. that I want to ask you also at some point how you recommend dentists seek the right people to work with because they all come in, yes. you're hiding in the back already, yes. right? So somehow they, they get to the gatekeeper, they make an appointment with us and we have a meeting with them and they come in and they present their uh, little proposal. And they say, oh, you got to do this for three months. You got to be on this radio station yeah. or on this TV. And then you do it for three months and you're a bunch of money out and one patient shows yeah. up. And then you do, and then you bring them back in and it's always the same story, right? You bring them back in and say, hey, what's going on? I paid you guys this much money. I'm not seeing yeah, the returns. It's... Nobody's calling. Oh, sir, you got to do that another three yeah. months, right? And you're six months into it, into this black hole. Yes. And then you lose faith. Well, then let's do this. Let's do an inter... Not an intervention, but a turnout. You ask me some questions, and then I'll come back after a while and ask you some new ones. So ask me anything you want. So that would be great. Well, first of all, I kind of, I'm sure everybody wants to know what has been your motivation to help so many people and save uh, $21.7 billion or more for your clients over the years. What is the... What it's, is it's actually, it's, it's, it's going to be very evident when I explain it. When you learn, which I have because I've been involved in a thousand industries, when you see how many higher, better, safer, more profitable, more powerful ways there are of not just doing something, but of accessing a market, communicating, attracting prospects, converting them to buyers, ethically sustaining them, uh, growing them, generating referrals, and you see how little of that knowledge is known by most people, you realize that most people spend the most important part of their life, the investment of time, effort, 
opportunity cost, expectation, uh, the, the, the desire for not just economic fulfillment, but psychic fulfillment, accepting a fraction of a fraction of the outcome, the yield, the payoff, the, the time, the effort, the opportunity, the market, the access to the market could be producing, and no one in their right mind gets up on a Monday morning, goes to their, in your case, their office, their practice, and says to themselves, self, I'm going to basically work my heart out and I'm going to produce a fraction of the income, a fraction of the residual future income, a fraction of the referrals. They don't do that on purpose. They just don't know how much better the the opportunity, the effort, the interaction, the resource deployment could be. And I've been very, very blessed. I've seen so many ways to do things better that I'm on a mission. I have been for 40 years to try to say, whoa, you don't have to do it that way just because everyone else you follow does it that way. And when you talk about, uh, just in your little question, how do you know who to trust or not? Well, there's a, a, a lot of ways to do it. The first is I, if, if you were a private client, I would say, okay, somebody comes to you with a proposal like that. The first thing you want to do is figure out what generically they are. Are they a, a radio station? Are they a ad agency? Are they a dental consultant? Whatever they are, you want to look up and you want to identify 10, 15 of their contemporaries, 10 other radio station, dental consultants, whatever they are, and you want to learn how to interview them. You want to do a Socratic interview where you ask them all the same questions and then you evaluate the answers and you want to ask them meaningful questions. And you can't ask meaningful consequential questions if you don't develop consequential critical thinking. And the kind of questions I would say is, okay, first of all, you're saying if I uh, run three months on this station, if that's the hypothesis, or this Facebook approach and spend this amount of money, I should be getting what? And if they say, well, I don't know, then I'd say, well, then why should I trust you? If they give you a finite answer, I want to know why. I want to know five or seven current, not past, but current clients that have and are doing that. And are doing it doesn't mean they're just making money. I want to know that they followed what you're saying. Then I want to stop and I want to interview multiples of your contemporaries, people in the same, and I want to ask them the same question. You're a radio rep. I want to know, and I want to not just ask them in your market. I want to ask them in other markets. You're a radio rep. I want to ask you some questions. Uh, or I'd call the station and say, I want to talk to a radio rep that represents dentists. Then I'd get him and I'd say, I want to know from scratch. I'm a new dentist, or I'm a dentist that doesn't use radio, and I want to know if I want to use radio, what do you recommend that is the safest but the most predictable strategy? What's it going to cost? How am I going to do it? How long will it take? What do you think worst case expectation is? You've been doing this. Can I talk to three people you've done it for that are still active that followed this? And I'd keep doing that over and over again when I got lots of knowledge. I would make sure that people, I want to know who says the same thing, who says different. I want to verify the people they tell me about. If they say, well, I've got older clients that no longer do this. And I want to know the reason they don't. And I want to talk to them. And I want to basically use my intelligence to do three things. One is verify what they say to be truth. Second, I want to know that at least three or four other people followed that and it worked and they're still doing it. Number three, I want to listen to other competitors of them tell me their strategy and see if they overlap, if they're different. And I want to see who has the most trust sounding. Then I want to talk to their, their clients. And then I want to go to people outside the market that are not competing for me but will give me another. And with that, I want to basically evaluate using the most intelligent overlay of logic, of uh, 
of uh, people who say the same thing and also of people who verify the most predictable success. And I want to make sure that they're not overzealous in what they're saying. I always want to know worst case when I'm asking anyone about anything new I want to try. Huh. I don't want you to say, hey, Jay, you should get uh, 10 new patients a month. Starting in month three, maybe you'll get one. one. So in consulting hundreds of thousands of clients, do you think that uh, business, as the saying goes, business is business, uh, uh, or do you think that different markets like healthcare, uh, dentistry, medicine, from the clients that you've had, I'm sure, in the space, should be approached differently with some compassion and different messages or different approaches to, to marketing? Yes and no. That would confuse you. So <laughs> I am known worldwide for having created universal <coughs> principles that have been adapted, adopted, uh, extrapolated, and applied to almost every kind of industry and profession out there. Some of them have to be adjusted or can't be used verbatim just because of regulations. But if you think about all businesses, all businesses are based on, first of all, attracting prospects, converting them to buyers, patients, mm -hmm. clients. If ethical and need, selling them the most that they need, mm -hmm. not the most you can get them to buy, getting them to come back at the maximum frequency that is in their best interest, not yours, getting them to come back as long as practical for their best interest, and getting them to refer or source for you the most possible, getting basically your business, your practice, to be seen in their eyes or their mind as the only viable choice they can turn to because you're preeminent, uh, having a culture that basically animates the spirit of everyone, the buyer, i.e. the patient, the team, everyone, uh, I don't think it's any different. You know, I teach people to know relative value. For example, you talk about marketing. If you market, you've got all kinds of media and all kinds of marketing choices. All sources aren't the same and all kinds of buyers or patients aren't the same. You have to understand predictable yield. Most, most business owners, and I'd say to dentists as well, they don't really look at business uh, as a three-dimensional uh, investor would. They look at it two-dimensional. They look at revenue, I guess you'd call it uh, uh, collections minus expenses. Yes, and that's A profit. true entrepreneur looks at a third dimension, which is yield. Yeah. So if I bring a patient in today for a process, I want to know what it costs me to bring him or her in. I want to know what the yield is on it today, but that's not really what I want to know. I want to know what my predictable revenue will be from that patient in year one, how many years they'll come, what predictable additional uh, procedure services will probably resolve, result, what offshoots, referrals will come from it. If I add different services, how that, and if I don't know those things, I have no idea the game I'm playing. Right. Now, that's one thing. You, you talked about referrals. I've done probably more extensive work in referral marketing than I think anyone in the, in, in the country or the world because I realized long ago that most professional businesses or practices gain an enormous amount of their, their uh, business from referrals or word of mouth. Yes. 20, 30, 50, 80, 100 percent, and yet almost none of them have in place even one formalized, systematized referral generating process, yeah. which makes no sense because yeah. a referral generated patient, they buy quicker, they negotiate less, they, uh, they stay longer, they avail themselves of more uh, services, they are more enjoyable to deal with, they cost you nothing, and they refer more people, and yet the same, in your case, dentists, that don't have 
any or many referral generating systems will piss away money on ads, all kinds of other things yeah. into the outside market and don't even realize that that market, you're generating the most outer periphery of trust. You have to work your ass off to go from from raising the hand to coming, and even if they use you the first time, they're still apprehensive, whereas a referral-generated patient is already sold on you. They're in, and they're in for whatever it is because they know what you cost, they know what you yeah. do, they know you're trustworthy, and yet very few dentists have even one, let alone, I would imagine, five or seven referral generating systems working. Yes. Just a, just a couple of ideas. I, this is amazing that you said it. I actually re read an article recently by the SBA that reflected about a lot of the things that you just said in terms of customer acquisition costs. Uh, and also, you only get one chance to make a first impression, right? So when you no do. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But when you do succeed in that yes the referrals i mean it's the most powerful form of marketing i think is your word of mouth but i'm, I'm no very interested <laughs> <laughs> very Funny. interested to 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 learn more about your referral generating systems and we're going to get into that just just to reflect back up on something you said yes. so so you believe that there is a very high value which i completely agree with you with uh, with uh, the word of mouth but from gross revenue perspective from all these industries that you have visited what percent of your gross revenues would you allocate to, say, marketing or hiring consultants or getting into courses so and when that I answer, stuff? When I answer this question, you're going to laugh. Most people who allocate either a percentage or an arbitrary amount are either spending too much or too little. Different categories and different sources of business are worth more or less. Right. In other words, if you know somebody is going to come for implants, that person is worth a lot more to you than somebody that's going to come to have their teeth cleaned, isn't it? So, well, when you talk about yield, we're also yes. always looking at the lifetime span yeah, of what yeah, the patient is so going to spill. But, but there's another thing. If you have research and data, different sources are going to produce different quality of patients. Right. In other words, somebody coming from radio may be a lot different than somebody coming from uh, 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 an ad in the local community paper. May not, may. But if you don't know the relative difference, there's not a right or wrong. One of the things we teach to a lot of clients, assuming cash flow uh, is appropriate, I would think that if you're playing a long game, which I would think as a dentist you would, you're not looking at a one shot unless you're doing very specialized procedures, you would be very comfortable spending up to and even more, if you could afford it, than 100% of the first transaction to start that relationship because the sooner you start the first transaction, the sooner you get the second, the third, the referrals, everything And else. the first transaction is usually the comprehensive exam and the cleaning yeah, and some whatever, x-rays yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So you know, it's it a good be, opportunity, yeah. right? It could be a, you know an anomaly. Somebody's got a cavity or a broken tooth or something, but that's going to be a referral anyhow, isn't it, usually? That's right, yes. Uh, so, but yeah, but I think you can be very, I mean, the good news about dentists when you understand true marketing, marketing is very analytical. There's, I mean, there's, there's artistry and there's, and there's uh, 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 talent involved, but it starts by understanding the numbers that a Patient is worth X to you over the course of a period of time. So one of the one of the leaders that I've it's an had, asset. It's an asset, right? You're, you're really investing in an asset that's going to pay dividends, and you have to look at it as if you were it was a hedge fund. Different different assets produce different relative yields and relative volatility. And if you don't understand what that is then you're probably going to either reallocate wrong, invest wrong, have the wrong portfolio, if that right. makes sense. So we're talking with Dr. Blatchford, one of the America's leading consultants. Yes. He said that 20% uh, of your patients, the top 20% of your patients generate the top 80% of your revenue. Doesn't right? surprise me. So his contention is that if you don't like what the insurance companies pay you, stay out of 
out of network with them yes. and just give the bills or whatever to the patient and tell them you'll help them file with their with their insurance but we don't want to diagnose patients and treat them based on what the insurance company says they're going to cover yes so that's also the problem so uh, in that case uh, um, uh, we we have to realize these numbers and understand where our revenues come from and they come from the people that we treat the best the, the and most, understand and what are the you know, what are the overlying profiles and denominators of the patients who first of all are the most desirable and also who understand a cash practice if right. that's what you're operating don't you think right because if you're going after the wrong profile that alone it makes no sense if you want i mean if you say hey i'm only getting people for whom they only want to go to the extent their insurance coverage vis-a-vis I want to build a high-end practice of people who are very comfortable paying cash because they understand what I deliver above and beyond my 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 contemporary. But you you get pretty much what you strategically uh, create. It's not. I mean, if people don't get the outcome in a career that they want, in my opinion, there's two percent act of God that are just freaky things you can't you can't control. 98% are either decisions you make or don't make, actions you take or don't take, or, this is the latter one, they're either laws, principles, elements that are immutable that you just fail to acknowledge or understand or harness and you let whipsaw you. It's pretty simple, really. It's not, not, it's not rocket science. Yes, um, in my opinion, uh, experience trumps all. Uh, it's my personal opinion. And so expound on that. So we're in harmony. What does that mean to you? So to me, it means that for for my colleagues, if they want to prosper and succeed, they need to turn people that have experience, that have done it, that have failed. Because you can do it two ways. Either you're going to pay millions of dollars and make those mistakes and and and, and wisen up yeah. after a while, or you turn to somebody who has already paid those millions and of I dollars. Agree. I agree. And pick up on their brain and, and what works, but finding the right, right people uh, is, and you're going to get the best advice uh, mostly from, see the dentist when they're five miles close together, they're yes. supposedly not, yes. not friends. Yes. But when, <laughs> when it's outside of five miles, they're best friends. That's hilarious. And, 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 I get it. And uh, th that's not the way it should be because dentists uh, uh, usually we listen to each other on, on recommendations and that's part of the whole peer-to-peer -peer concept that we're building is to turn to our colleagues. So you give away millions of dollars of free advice on, on your website, uh, jabrahams.com in the Fifty Shades section. It's just abraham.com, uh, uh, not even J, just Abraham. Just Abraham, okay, abraham.com. Abraham 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 and uh, uh, can you expand, uh, uh, besides the programs, the keynotes, the audios, can you expand what else they can find in that, uh, uh, in that on, on my well, website? Uh, the stuff that you have on the Fifty Shades oh, section. If the majority of people aren't going to be able to afford me, or if they aren't able to discern why they should afford me, somebody has to take the first investment. If you're not able, to afford me, I have nothing to lose by investing richly in you because worst case, you'll grow and maybe you can't afford me or you'll know somebody who can and you'll be my greatest advocate. Hang on to that, right there. So true leaders lift other people up. They don't, they don't bring people down. So what you're doing is actually, the way you're explaining it is very interesting to me because ultimately you said if they are able to afford you in the future, you're yeah. giving them that knowledge yeah. that will we'll grow them. enable and if them they to. Can't, They'll still do better if they if if, if they're if they're uh, voyeurs who don't really take action. Giving them everything doesn't really matter. If they're if they're men or women with a prejudice towards action, implementation, execution, my materials are so world recognized and validated that if they just take a handful and actuate on it, they're going to get positive result. And that result will get me goodwill. If they do it enough, they'll be able to spend money with me. If they do it semi enough, but they grow, they will tell bigger ones they use. I mean, there's no downside. Excellent to strategy. Me. Excellent strategy. And it works. I mean, it works. Let's see if we can get some more free advice out of Jay here. 
<laughs> so when you talk about the 93 methodologies yeah. of, of... We actually now have over 150. Oh, wow. Yeah. You, that increased. We've, we've expanded. That. You're talking about for referrals. What, what would be the one or other strategies you, you would tell doctors to take that have been burnt over and over and over by marketers? Well, to recover possibly yeah. even some of those funds. Well, let, let's start. If you don't consciously have, let's talk about no cost and cost, okay? No cost, first of all. If you don't have multiple referral generating systems working in your practice, shame on you because within reason... Are you talking multi-channel marketing or are you talking... Multi-faceted, I mean different referral systems. Referral systems have three or four different uh, factors or denominators to them. Some can be done all the time. Some only can be done at certain convergent times. Some seasonal. So I mean you have to know all the options available and figure out which ones you would want to use for yourself. But what do you mean with referrals? Are you talking about texting patients about their appointments or giving them, sending them birthday cards or are you talking about uh, certain actions that will actually generate... Well, let me give you the most profound that we've seen people do when they really believe in themselves and it starts a whole uh, avalanche of positivity. So if you really want to be a referral generating practice what you could do and what we've had people do is you sit down the first time you have a consult or a meeting with a prospective patient and when they call in the first thing that anyone asks is who referred you irrespective of whether they were referred or not and they say you know the bulk of this practice is a referral based uh, practice then you sit down with them you the the dentist and you say uh, I want to tell you about the uniqueness of our practice what you should expect from us every time you ever come into this office and correspondingly what we will expect from you in return the first thing you say is first of all when you come to our office and you have an appointment you should expect to be seen in a very short timeline not having to be waste, have your time wasted or disrespected unless there's an emergency. I'm looking you in the eye, I'm telling you, you will get seated within seven minutes of your appointment. When you come in, I can promise you this. Number one, I will treat you the same way I would treat my son or daughter, mother, father, husband and wife with the utmost of care. I will make the decisions, the recommendations the treatment protocols that I think are in your best interest, not the ones that are the most profitable. You should expect me to treat you with zero pain. That doesn't mean you won't have a little prick when I inject you, but I operate a pain-free practice and that's what you should expect. You should get outcomes that are world-class and those depend on what the treatment is. If we are repairing a tooth, you should look at it, feel it, it should be as good if not better than it was before. If it's cosmetic, you're gonna get people telling you how great you look, you're going to have a new sense of, of self-esteem, you're gonna be proud, it's gonna be great, and it'll also be tremendous, and you go on and on. You can say, all of those are what you should expect from us. Once and after I and my team validates, let me tell you what we expect in exchange for you. A, we expect you to make your appointments and be on time because uh, our business basically is a utilization of allocation of our availability. If you are late or you don't show up, you take opportunity costs not just out of our pocket, but out of someone else that might need us more. So if you make an appointment, keep it. If you can't keep it, you must let us know at least 28 or 48 hours ahead or we will be forced to charge you and you need to acknowledge that that's the time you've gotten reserved for you. When you come, be 
as open about what you're here for, any other issues, so you don't leave and we don't find out you had another pain somewhere else and you complain about it. Be open and truthful and collaborative. <clears throat> when we have dealt with you, pay your bill because frankly, we are a professional uh, organization focused solely on your, uh, on your oral hygiene, your dental care, your cosmetic superiority. Sure, We're, not a bank. We're not a bank. Yeah. We don't want to be a collection agency. Once and after you've done that and we have performed, we would expect over the course of any six month period, in the general uh, course of your interaction with friends, relatives, co-workers, employees, colleagues, church members, you are going to get people that talk about the fact that they need a dentist, they need a new dentist, they don't like their dentist, and we will expect you to refer at least two equal quality people that you know would be appropriate to us. Sometimes they have to be on our waiting list, but we are a referral generated practice. We prefer investing our resources and time in training, technology, equipment, that lets us serve you better rather than investing it in marketing. If we're going to do that, we ask in exchange that you reinvest in us because we're both getting a better out. And that's just an example. Wow, very good. Yes, so the customized approach is always and there's better. There's lots of, I mean, I've got dozens and dozens, as I said, over 150 strategies. Sometimes there's strategies that you introduce when See. there's new technology. Sometimes there's strategies that you use to discuss other procedures that you are doing for other patients that the patient in either the treatment room or the, or the cleaning room wouldn't need, but probably knows somebody that would. There's just lots of different strategies. But this is the whole different tone than I hear from you than you would hear, for example, in a, in a staff meeting in the morning of in a corporate setting where they say, hey, here are bottom line numbers that we have to meet today. Right. You got to, totally this is a totally different story, right? So, so I think easily uh, the, the concept that you discussed. But it can be measurable. It's very, I mean, <clears throat> it's a strategic approach that will produce out, outsized and outrageously massive improvements over time if you integrate a number of these. Uh, and it makes everybody perform at a higher standard of, uh, of commitment, respect, contribution. There's a purpose for everybody. Everybody has a purpose. And people Absolutely. work harder for you and with you yeah, when there's a purpose and they're yeah. respected, right? Yeah, and you can reward your team for referrals as well. But there's really one, when you realize you are a referral generated, even now, if you don't realize that, when you get a referral, everyone in the practice should be proud. That is an affirmation that somebody had enough respect, confidence, appreciation, trust in you and your staff's conduct, performance, outcome to feel comfortable in trusting your name to somebody that was important to them. That's a great affirmation and acknowledgement. But most people don't stop and say, what does a referral really represent? Very interesting. Yeah, we never discussed about referral systems. That brings me back to the discussion, and, and thank you for that response, Jay. I was referred to you by another dentist who, yes. who hired you as yeah. a consultant who right. had over, you know, I mean, I don't want to mention his business, but he had, uh, from what I understand, over 10x and in, in revenue increase for his business that was partially clinical practice and courses and other things that he yes. was doing. We need someone like you, and we need many Jay Abrahams in our profession to regain our autonomy back. So I discussed with you in possibly structuring um, a scenario that my colleagues can afford, where we would have mastermind groups with yes. 10 to 15 doctors, yes. maybe once or twice a year, yes. um, uh, to help as many doctors as we can. And, uh, and uh, uh, we're gonna have one with you in July, our, our first one from July 11th, 13th, I believe. Uh, uh, no, 13th to 15th, actually, three-day scenario. Yes of a workshop. 
Could you kind of give us an idea how you approach a professional uh, group of sure. doctors and what, what, you, what your thoughts are about mastermind groups? I've heard on other podcasts that they work. People bring all of their concerns, their problems, the things they would want to change. And there's answers for them uh, by you and yeah. also 15, 20 other minds, you yeah. know? Uh, well, first of all, uh, I have been doing variations of what we're talking about for 40 years. They get better and better because I keep getting broader and broader in my knowledge. When you can borrow uh, philosophy, ideology, methodology, technology, uh, strategy from all kinds of outside industries and combine them into hybrids and apply them to industries that don't know them, you can produce outrageous and explosive growth. But the concept is this. First of all, anyone... Okay, if you're the smartest person in a room, you're in the wrong room. You don't want to be. No. You want to learn from people smarter than you. Right. However, what you will find is different people default to different strategies, different approaches, and they get sort of inculcated into that. They don't think there's alternatives. So the first thing that we do is we try to figure out what somebody's philosophy, belief system, strategy, marketing, management, uh, sense of, of, of monetization uh, dynamics, in other words, how they value uh, a patient, how they value the asset, the, how they look at uh, uh, you know, the, the life expectancy, what their patients are worth, how they position themselves, and then we evaluate whether that is the highest and best use of thinking, strategy, action, the resources they deploy. And by going around the room continuously, we start with, uh, we, we have the participants, first of all, prepared because they have to answer about 200 questions that most of them have never thought about. They're very they're very pragmatic and they're very uh, strategic sometimes, tactical sometimes, philosophical sometimes. But we ask them questions they should have asked themselves constantly. I'm a great believer in a quote that's a derivative of Socrates. Socrates said, a life unexamined is a life not worth living. I believe a business that's not constantly examined and re-examined from every measurable performance indices, including satisfaction, fulfillment, is not worth owning. So the first thing we do is have you, a little shockingly, try to answer 200 questions of which you probably can only answer about 25%. And that's okay. That's a question that I would get at the beginning yeah, yeah, of the workshop, they, I before assume. Before they came. Before, before they came, yeah. Wow. So that, uh, and I review all of them so I have a context mm. of understanding. But then we start by having everybody introduced to everyone else, who they are, where they, in your case, where they practice, what their practice is based on, you know, what generates their practice, what the key driver is, uh, you know, their belief system. So we have on the table foundational understanding of at least the macro operating belief of each person in the room, which usually are going to be very different because some people have no marketing, some people total marketing, some people's marketing is just as radio, some people's marketing is this, that, some people have a lot of, of, uh, of uh, procedures generated internally by their staff, some don't. So we want to figure out what each person in that room's business model is whether it's acknowledged by them or not. So we sort of, we precipitate that out. Then we ask everybody in that room to identify what their biggest challenge is, their biggest uh, problem, their biggest untapped or underperforming opportunity. And before we ask them to review it, we give them referenceable context because a lot of them don't even know how to really come up with the biggest, the best. They don't even know what they feel, so we give them stimulus, examples, uh, uh, scenarios within their realm. So then they each come up with all those, and then we go around the room 
in a really fascinating process. And the first thing we do is we have each one pose the one biggest problem, question, issue, challenge, opportunity. If they got nothing else out of this, that would make the biggest difference and transformation in their life, their practice. And then I address it to the best I can through a bunch of interaction. And we go around the whole room and each one gives us the first one. When we get to the end of that right. circle of people, we go backwards and each person shares the one insight that they got themselves from listening that was additive to their own thinking. Plus they reiterate what I said in their own words back to that dentist in that case. And the reason why is when you are in any kind of a learning environment, people don't realize you only retain 9%. And that's 9% if it is linear and standard. My modest, my model and my operating uh, style is very non-linear. It's very powerful, but your mind starts tripping out and you don't hear half of what's said. So if you normally get 9%, you only get four and a half. So I make sure every one of your colleagues restates two things, what they uniquely got out of it, and what they want to make sure you got out of it in their own words. So mm. you're layering every experience from many different facets. Then we go and we do another round. After we, it's same thing, back and forth. After a couple, two or three rounds, now I have a context of understanding real felt needs, not what was put on the questionnaire, but real felt needs. And so I can go deep on issues that are universal to the group that have been precipitated by that and we have all kinds of referenceable material and detail and I can go and pull a PowerPoint on something that's vertical like referral generation then we give them a whole course on it but we build it it, it is it is not standardized it gets modified continuously and it's uh, it's regulated by the responses, if that makes sense. Nothing is constant but change. But I keep doing it in levels, and then we play the game differently the second day, and it just keeps going. And then by the time we're done, everybody reviews. Then you go around, and everybody uh, explains the biggest the biggest on a de at a descending order of viability priority, what they themselves have got out of it, and what they're going to do different. And then we give them a couple of hours to plan and then they put together an action plan of what they're really going to do and when. And then we have them uh, partially present and I critique. But by seeing all the different ways people are seeing this experience, if, if in this case, if they bring a, a colleague or an associate from their practice, if 30 people hear the same thing, 29 people hear it different. Yes. You know the idea about to a carpenter, everything is a hammer and a nail. If you're somebody whose reference frame on practice building is uh, you don't do any marketing, it's just organic, that's your reference. If somebody is totally Is that person wrong? Well, they're not right or wrong. The thing is, is, is if you, I've, I've been trained on working on the geometry of a business. The same action or less, the same time or less, same opportunity or less, the same career commitment or less, same resources or less, could produce many times more yield today and residually by doing things different. Most people do one thing. I was, for 40 years ago, was teaching that if you build your business on multiple integrated sources, it brings to bear the geometry of a business. Uh, I, I'm known for working on the three ways to grow a business, which brings geometry to bear. I'm known for the nine drivers of, of exponential growth, with, which brings geometry to bear. I'm known for the power Parthenon, which brings geometry. And just recently, we actually came out with a a, an even uh, loftier methodology and, and ideology, which is called taking your business profits beyond exponential. You're a scientist. I have 30 plus categories, not, not techniques, but big categories, sort of like 
referrals that have all these different variations. Dentists that, like that, by the way. Evidence-based research, we love that. Well, everything I've done is empirically based. I was trained, just for the background, I was trained, uh, I've helped over 300 of the top experts in the world. They did not come to me for help with their expertise. They came to command more from it, to delineate, to get it to be correlated more tangibly. I worked with the Deming Organization, the father of process improvement optimization. Wow. I worked at the largest multivariable testing organization in the world. I worked with the largest strategic litigation consulting firm that had 150 PhD sociologists and psychologists. Wow. And I'm best friends, not best friends, I'm very good friends with the number one guy in the world in Six Sigma. Oh, Six Sigma, So sure. I got a lot of different, but it's given me through osmosis a very <laughs> deep understanding of, of, of measurement, quantification, variation, uh, I mean, things like that. But uh, yeah, so I try to basically get people to bring to bear optimal, strategic, and preeminent thinking, which is uh, it's integrating three different things, making everything you do produce the highest and best result, return, use of people, time, outcome, now and in the future. Wow being strategic, so everything you do is going to set up the next and the next and the next outcome, and also being preeminent, because preeminence has a duality. It, it executes much more powerfully to the recipient, but it feels so much more satisfying to the provider, including your whole team. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes great sense, and uh, again, uh just the fact that you are willing to help us. Dentistry has a tremendous uh, future uh, um, and it needs people like yourself. Other medical industries are far too gone uh, where they have internal consultants and they put you into the continuing education and the kind of stuff that generates the most profit for them uh, in, in training. So for, for our situation, I think dentists will be very excited that we can use this peer-to-peer -peer concept and the, the, the idea of purchasing power. You know, most of the people that are selling or companies that are selling something, they just want to sell. They don't care being in the drama, being loyal to this other corporation. They just want to sell their product. So when, when bigger companies come to the table and they have purchasing power, uh, uh, they can get tremendous discounts. Yes. So when a multinational entity hires you, obviously they have very good comfort on compensating you. But when I go to my colleagues and say, hey guys, if you get 20, 30 guys together, that's you have the right. same purchasing. Economies purchasing. of scale, that's right. Yeah, economies of scale. Yeah. So we can get the same information that they are. And I appreciate you for that. And there'll be a lot of information in the next few months on my social media platforms for my colleagues, um, explaining the location and um, the, the program that we're going to be conducting to uh, to learn a lot from Jay and uh, boost our practices a little bit. This has been very good. So let me conclude by asking you one final question, okay? So I always, when I do an interview of, of someone else, not when it's back and forth, I always want to know what more than anything else they want the audience to take away from them that is going to have the most sustainable impact, the most leverage a message, a realization, uh, a, an insight, a recommendation, whatever. What's the one thing you want to leave this interview on your side, having everyone who's a dentist or anyone who's an entrepreneur recognize that is really important for you to convey? Half of the equation in business is, is marketing and uh, creating referral systems, in my beliefs. So no matter how good we are in our businesses and private practices, we need to master networking and creating referral systems that are in line with our revenue streams. And we don't have the same uh, uh, purchasing power as others, so we can't make that many mistakes. We have to be very precise in, uh, in execution. And knowledge is, 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 is powerful only when executed. Uh, <laughs> Touche. So, so we have to find better ways. We have to enable each other to our to the peer-to-peer -peer system that we're creating. This is one example of it, with the many others from different aspects of the industry. A comprehensive approach, as you discussed. So, we continue to uh, find ways to enable and empower our colleagues 
to increase their business acumen. That's the that's the mission of this. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Thank I you so much it. for your time, Jay. No, my pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you.